So query optimization 101, uh, we're going to talk about all this stuff. Uh, I have 55 minutes and like 63 slides, so you know, do the math of how we're, how we're going to go through this. Um, this is actually a redacted training session, um, so a lot of what is in this material is part of our standard training that we do at Percona, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, we'll talk really quickly about the, how query planning takes place in MySQL, what are some of the common query mistakes that I have seen and that some of the other uh, consultants at Percona have seen as well. How do you find unoptimized queries in your MySQL system? What are some things that you can do other than explain, which is what we're going to talk about in the first section, and then what can you do going beyond what MySQL gives you kind of at the basic level? Uh, quick introduction. How many of you actually have heard of Percona? Everybody in the room? That slide is done. That's great. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew, not Matt. That's somebody else. Uh, I've been with Percona. I just did the math, 9.67 years. Um, I am a senior architect and senior trainer in the professional services department at Percona. I specialize in MySQL and training. So that if you do want any type of MySQL training, uh, also uh, proxy SQL and group replication and Percona should be a cluster. And if you want Mongo training or Postgres training, we do all of that now. Okay. Uh, Particularly for me, I've had my SQL experience going back as far as 2005, 2006-ish in everything from SAS to massive sharding to hosted environments. And I even did, dabbled in uh, IP telecom uh, early on in my, I just graduated from the college and I hear work on this system type stuff. So familiar with a lot of things. All right, let's jump into query planning. So you got a query in MySQL. Obviously you want it to go fast, right? Otherwise, why are, you, why are you using it? What's the process with MySQL when you want to know what this query, how is this query going to be executed? You ask MySQL, what do you intend to do? That starts with a keyword that's known as explain. You're going to ask MySQL, here's my query. What do you intend to do with this query? How are you going to access and find that data? MySQL is going to give you an answer. That answer could be right, it could be wrong. MySQL doesn't tell you that. MySQL just says, this is what I'm going to do. It's up to you to interpret what MySQL tells you is whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. And hopefully, I will show you what some of those bad things mean so that when you go see that, you can say, oh, yeah, Matthew said that's a bad thing. We know we need to do something to make that query better. Like I said, it all starts with this keyword, explain. Obviously, we don't have time to go through the entire user manual of what's in Explain, so go check it out if there's something in here. There's a ton more. Like I said, this training material, this is usually about three hours long. Uh-oh. No, I'm just referencing the current version of MySQL, which is four years old now, which we have all kind of been, I've noticed that we all kind of been harping on that a lot, but yeah. Somebody asked uh, early in the pre one of the previous talks, like, who's still using MySQL 4? And I almost raised my hand and said, I have a client with MySQL 4 on Windows NT. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, ah, that's not. Yeah. But yes, it's sadly enough, we still have uh, many. The w and then the ones I get are like, we're forced to use 5.6. Like, no, nothing's forcing you to use 5.6. Anyway, all right, let's take a look at this example. Hopefully, everybody can see it. Apologize if you're in the back and you can't read my tiny font, but I have to smush it all in one slide. This says, my example query says explain, that's that keyword, we prefix our select statement. Actually, this works for inserts, updates, deletes, and selects, okay? So explain in my query, and then this is the output that the optimizer is going to tell you. So this query actually goes to the optimizer, it just basically doesn't execute it, okay? So this is not, not actually executing the query, this is just basically the optimizer going in and saying, how am I going to find these rows? Is there an index to use? If so, let's use it. Can I use it? Is it, opt you know, is it the better of multiple types of uh, indexes that are available? Those are the choices. I'll point out one red flag is this right here, where this says type ALL. That right there is, if you take away anything and you didn't know anything, take that away. Take that away that if you see ALL, that's a full table scan. That's going to read every single row in that table. Worst case scenario is it's all on disk, and you have to read all those disk IOPS and put it into the memory. Okay. Right? Which table we're using, which indexes were possible that we could have used, which one did we use, how long was that index, approximately how many rows are we going to have to read, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah? And if you want to know what the whole bunch of other stuff means, you'll have to go read the manual or have me come out and I will we'll go more into depth in our standard stuff. All right? So this is it. We asked MySQL, what do you intend to do? MySQL gave us this, and Matthew just said, that means bad. 
right? So what can we do? Well, obviously, we're going to have to add an index. Okay? Where are we going to add the index? Ideally, we want to look for our equalities, because that's what we're filtering our data on. So let's add an index on that title column. Now, one thing I didn't show you guys was the schema makeup of that table. Okay? So we're going to try and add our index. And in this particular case, this is a unique situation, we're going to get this error message. And like I said, I didn't show you guys the schema of the table, but I can tell you that this column title is of type text. And a text field, does anybody know how many characters can fit into a text field? Nobody? Nobody knows? 65,535, right? Everybody knows their powers of two, right? So there's a problem because there are internal limitations with how long an index entry can be. It's 1,000 bytes. Okay? So since this is a text field that could have up to 65,000 characters, we can't, that's obviously longer than 1,000 bytes. So this is a unique situation. Most of the time, you probably have varchar 20s, varchar 30s, things like that, and you have never run into this. But if you have really long string columns, you might have this problem. So how do we fix that in this particular case? MySQL has something that's known as built-in prefix indexes. So I can actually say, take the first 30 characters of that column and index just those. I've been told that that's a unique feature to MySQL that nobody else really has. They have the capabilities of doing that in other databases, but it's not as easy as this. So yay, all that stuff. Okay, so now we've added our index. So what I said earlier, we ask MySQL, what do you intend to do? MySQL tells us. We determine whether or not we like that answer or not. We make some kind of change. That change can be modifying the schema, or that change could be modifying the query. In some cases, that could also be modifying the data. And what I mean by that is like by archiving. Instead of having 4 billion rows on the table, now you archive off a bunch of old stuff, and you now only have 1 million rows. That's a change as well. And the optimizer is going to treat that differently. Okay? So now that we've made a change, let's ask again the same exact question, what do you intend to do now? Now that I've made a change, what do you intend to do? And this obviously looks, for those of you who are nodding along, looks a lot better. Okay? This is no longer a full table scan. This is now a referential lookup. And referential lookup is an equality on a secondary index. So that's good. Right? So the amount of rows. Previously, we were looking at 3.3 million rows approximately. Now we're looking at approximately four. I keep saying approximately because this is based off of statistics that the engine provides, not actual lookup values. All good? Question? The key length is 52 because this is a uh, UTF-8 column, and a UTF-8 column can be up to three bytes per character. And then there's a... Oh, so that's third. Oh, so the question is here. So this is the first 30 characters. This is not the f number of bytes. This is to the first 30 characters. And so because the column type is encoded as UTF-8, that means it could be up to three bytes per character. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My math is bad. OK. I see your problem now. I see you're doing the math and going 3 times 3 is 90, not 52. So that's. It's most likely because I copied this slide from a previous training, and this number is wrong for the previous slide. So thank you for calling me out on that. But that's the question. So the question is, why is this 52? This is, a, I, this is an older number. It's an older number, because this slide, sorry, uh, this slide it used to be title 50. I used it in a previous iteration. I updated it, but I didn't update this slide. So there, he caught me. OK, so that's why that's 52. It's basically telling me the length. What's the maximum particular index length I needed to go through? So at some point, this will need to look at 52 bytes per entry to answer the question. That's really only useful when you get into composite indexes. So if you have multiple columns inside one index and you want to know how effective, like are we using all of those pieces of that multi-column index, you would need to do the math to determine, am I using this one, this one, and that one by just doing the column, the, doing the key length. Uh, math. Does that make sense? Or did I just confuse you even more? Okay. Okay. Sorry. I have a bad habit of that. What are some other ways that we could access this table? Primary key. So maybe I have this number cached somewhere already. So primary key, primary key. This is a constant level access. Can't go anything faster than that. You can't access an NODB table faster than the primary key. Right? 
like. Hopefully you're all familiar with like as well. This is a wildcard expression inside MySQL. We use the percent sign. This is now a range scan. So we've seen full table scans, index lookup, or secondary index lookup, primary key lookup. This is now a range scan. Why is this a range scan? Well, it's a wild card. So we're looking at everything from BAMB blank to BAMB ZZZZZ, right? You've also probably seen betweens, ends, greater than, less than. Those are all ranges of data that we're looking for. Why are those ranges? I go my, to my graphic. We use B plus trees inside InnoDB. They have limited depth. I believe it's four, if I, my memory serves me correctly. My graphs are not to four. This is my picture. If you're unfamiliar with what a B tree is, B trees have a point of entry, and then you decide whether or not you're going to go left or right. So in this case, we're looking for everything that starts with B, A, M, B. So we ask ourselves, is B, M, B less than or greater than Kill Bill? Go over here. If it's less than or greater than Casablanca, if it's less than or greater than when we reach these leaf nodes inside InnoDB, this actually has our data. These are just road signs along the way. And then we store our data down here. So we will scan all of the pages that are in between here and here. So that's why we get a range scan. We're looking at a range of data. This type of query comes up very frequently from our support staff. Is this a range? How many of you believe this is a range query? How many of you believe this is a full, don't look, I'm sorry, what I was gonna say, how many of you believe it's a full table scan? It's like it's telling you it's a full table scan. This is my question is, why is this a full table scan? You're not, you can't answer any more questions. All right, there you go. So preceding wildcard. So what is this saying? When you think about, go back to our tree, what's this saying? Matthew just said we have to hit a point, and then do we go left or right? Yes, we have to go both. So that's why this ends up being a full table scan. We go to the left and scan the left half. We go to the right, scan the right half. We've effectively got a full table scan. So this one comes up frequently. This is, this is a bad example, but this usually comes up with uh, email addresses. So you want to say something like, find me all of my at Gmail users. So I say percent sign at gmail.com inside my users database. And then they complain and they say, well, I have an index on the email column, but it's still full table scanning. This is why. It has to do all of that. Yeah? This would always full table scan, yes. Yeah, if you said Fred at percent and you had an index on it, then yes, you would, you would be able to utilize the Fred part and find all the Freds and then find every wild card after Fred, yes. Yeah. No, you would use the index. You can't, you can't use part of the index and full table scan. You're all right, yeah, yeah, we answered that one. Okay, this is another one that comes up. Okay. So this one is find all the movies that start with Z. The explain plan looks okay. It's not full table scanning, so yay. It's using an index, about 25,000 rows. This looks good. Yeah. I'm going to change one thing about this query. I'm going to change one thing. Watch for it. Boom. I changed one thing. All I changed was a Z to a T. And I went from using an index to a full table scan. Anybody have any idea what? Nothing else changed. He's got it, got it right. Basically, how many movies out there start with Z? How many movies start with T? Right? So this is where you get into how your data itself is critical to how the optimizer is going to choose your index. There's a point where essentially the optimizer is trying to make a cost decision. I mean, it's a cost-based optimizer in MySQL. It's trying to make this choice of which is more expensive, more expensive in terms of disk I.O., memory, CPU, all that stuff. What's more expensive? If I go to the index, scan a bunch of stuff, and then I have to go back to the primary B tree and grab all of the row data? Or should I just go ahead and grab all the row data and do the filtering somewhere else? Do I want to do two steps? Or do I just want to do one step, but maybe reading a lot more information? That's essentially what this means right here. If I'm looking at a, if the optimizer says, you're going to look at a small amount of data, the index is cheaper. 
keep going, keep going, keep going. At some point, you're going to be looking at so much more data in the index, and we also have to go back to the main B tree to get the rest of the columns that you're looking for, because I don't have ID title and I'm uh, sorry, I don't have ID and production year as part of my index. The only thing that's part of my index is title. So I have to scan the title index to find all of those values, then go back to the main clustered index and find ID and production year. Those are not part of the index, so it's a two-step process. So at some point, it becomes more expensive to do both of them than it is just a full table scan. Yes? Yeah, if you only had if you only had select title, then that would be a, what's known as a covering index, and then all of the data that would that would be an index only scan, effectively. Yeah. Depending on the size of your table, I mean, if you had a ten megabyte table, those probably all fit inside one. Not one page, but yeah, like 50 or 60 pages, yes. So this is all of the rows in the table, yes. Yeah. Some of the rows, some of the row, you could have one page with, you know, every page in NODB is 16 kilobytes, and so you just divide that many. How, you have to find the, your row length and divide it by 16, and that's how many pages you have, yeah. Whoa, back in the back first. I'm going to tell you that this is not an exact science graph, that I'm just illustrating that at some point that will happen. It might be 10% for this table. It might be 25% for this table. It all depends on the size of the table, the length, the row length, what indexes are available, what not available. There's a lot more to it than just, than just a simple point. It's all, you also can't move this either. You can't. On this, on this example, on my example data set, yes, that was the case. But again, if, this, if, your, if your data set and your table are different, then obviously that's going to change as well. The advantage of forcing an index? The disadvantage of forcing an index is that you will still do like the two-step process. So if the optimizer says, it's cheaper for me to do a full table scan, but you're saying, no, use this index, you're gonna, it might take longer. So it could be less memory, less CPU, but it'll take longer because you're having to do this two-step process to go and find all the data. There's usually a reason why you have to use force index, and it's, it might be because your stats are out of date. So if you just did like a big bolt data load into that table and the optimizer hasn't, or the table hasn't had a chance to refresh the stats, the optimizer might be choosing something that it, does, it doesn't know about. So it doesn't know that you just inserted five gigs of data, and so if you did a quick reanalysis of the table's indexes, you might fix that problem without needing to use the force index. All right, so what do you take away from this? Data is critical. So if you've got a development environment, QA environment, try your darndest to convince the upper exec people or whomever that your dev environment should be a copy of your production environment for mainly this reason. You don't want to be testing the T% percent case in your development environment, push that code to production and have the Z% percent, or te I'm sorry, testing the Z% percent and have the T% percent effect, right? Because your dev environment's only 10% of your production environment. Right? There are obviously caveats to this. I understand that if you're in healthcare or some say, place with PII information that you can't do that. So there are some other tricks where you can actually copy the, uh, the optimizer statistics out of your production system and implant them into your dev system and then freeze them. And so you should get the same type of behavior. Um, that's advanced you know, query manipulation stuff, which we can help you out with if you wanted to know how to do that. Input values are also critical as well. Too often I see clients that are testing the Z% percent case and they're not thinking about the T% percent case. So the same sort of situation, this query worked great in our dev environment, then we rolled it out and all hell broke loose because 
the first user who came along to the system typed T percent and <laughs> so make sure that you're actually test not only your smoke tests but make sure you're grabbing some real world values that are coming from your users and testing with those values all right good questions a few more common query mistakes that we see unfortunately too often so now you can take a look at the schema for this table and then you can take a look at the query this one came up this was David's query that came up like like a month or two ago that was like oh we should throw that in the training so we've got an orders table got order ID got an index on order ID and there's data in this table select star from order where order ID equals blah 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 why did it full table scan? Somebody said it. So how many of you believe that order ID looking at this is a number? So if you look at the column type, the column type here is a var car. But what the user has requested is an integer. So internally, the optimizer there's three warnings on this, by the way. So if we did a show warnings, I've redacted some of the junk around it. This is basically saying that the optimizer is having to convert the data stored inside the table as string to integer. Well, if you convert data, you can't use the index. So modifying the query in this case to include the quotes turns that into a string. And now we have string comparison, and now we can use the index. So that is a very much, got to be aware of that. Yeah. No, dates should be in, inside strings as well, because if you put a space in there, then for like if with the, the timestamp, no, no, dates have to be in quotes as well. No. Only the difference would be if you're doing a date time versus timestamp. Because date time is stored effectively as a string, but timestamp gets converted to an integer, so that but that shouldn't affect any of the anything that you're doing there. All right, so that's a good one. How about this one? So I've got an index on production year, select star, and I'm calling this may date function. So just so that you, if you don't know what that function does, it takes the year 1922, and this is going to create a date out of it. January 1st, 1922. That's all it's doing. Is that, find everything where that's greater than a year ago. And again, full table scan. Anybody know why? You're not allowed to answer. Nope. Neither is Pep. And Kenny's not in here. Kenny's not allowed to answer questions either. Anybody know? Yeah, go ahead. No, I said it right here. Alter table movies, add index. Possible keys is no. Yep, that's right. Yeah, why? I'm applying a function, again, on top of that column. So the index for production year is the index of 1922, 1923, 1924, over and over and over. The index is not this. Therefore, I can't use the index. Because essentially, the optimizer is saying, I have to go to each row and run this function on every single row and then compare it, do, then do the comparison. Yeah? Does that make sense? Because the optimizer is looking and says, hey, I got an index here, but you're also asking me to run this function on top of that data all the time. Yeah? The simple fix in this case is to move your, essentially your constant value. So I want to now compare what's in my database to something better. And this still takes last year and takes the year function. So now I'm actually comparing 1922 to 1923, so on and so forth. So the rule of thumb is don't manipulate the data you're storing in your database to match your user input. You match your user input to the data in your database. If you feel like you have to manipulate the data in your database, that means you're storing the data wrong. Yeah? Yes. Ah, so it's not in here, but it's in. So in MySQL 8, since it was brought up, 
in MySQL 8, they introduced, well, it 5.72 technically, um, but in MySQL 8, they introduced indexes on functions. Okay, so in MySQL 8, you can now say add index on make date, yada, yada. So you can do that now in MySQL 8. How is it implemented under the hood? It's implemented as a virtual column, which have existed since 5.7. So even back in 5.7, you could have altered this table and added a generated column of the make date function and then applied an index on top of that. And you would have effectively done the same thing. Yeah. Good? Good so far? Let's find some of these bad queries. Instead of your application and digging through logs and stuff, how can MySQL tell us? MySQL can tell us in a couple different places. One is the slow query log that's existed since the beginning of MySQL's existence, I'm pretty sure. Slow query log is a file on disk. You would need to use something like PT Query Digest from the Percona Toolkit, free open source tool written in Perl, that will essentially read the log file, parse it, and aggregate all the statistics because the quer slow query log is just a never-ending linked list of the query and the stats behind executing that query. How long did it take? Did it full table? Excuse me, full table scan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. More, if you're in something like uh, RDS or GCP and you don't have access to the disk. Performance schema is where they're moving more and more stuff to. So there are specific tables inside the performance schema that you can query. And because everybody loves the name of tables inside the performance schema, events, statements, query, digest, history, length, foo, foo, whatever, you might want to look at the sys schema, which comes with every version of MySQL since 5.6, because there are some very simple views inside the sys schema that make looking at that data more easily. If you don't want to do either of those, just go install PMM, and we grab all that data for you which can use either the slow query log or the performance schema to grab and aggregate all that data. I'll show you guys a quick little screenshot here in one minute. With using PMM, I have not, I've not seen any. Do you know of any? The only, I think the only, uh, because the performance schema uh, essentially self, it like modif it uh, manages itself, because performance schema will only keep a certain number of uh, queries, depending on which table that you're querying. Uh, and the soil query log will go essentially forever and forever. I've only seen more uh, performance issues from MySQL in terms of the soil query log. If your soil query log grows unbounded, then it's MySQL that's having a problem. So, but if you use if you use PMM with the slow query log, PMM will auto rotate your slow query log for you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't think I don't think PMM needs needs in particular PMM needs that one. But there's yeah there's a few you can get. If you turn on too much inside performance schema, yeah, you'll you'll start hurting you'll start hurting yourself. In Percona Server, that's what I should have asked. Who's using Percona Server? Excellent, uh, Maria DB. Uh, uh, cloud hosted, like RDS, GCP, and then at some point I'm gonna ask the people who didn't on prem. Sorry, that was the other question. On prem, okay, all right. Some of you didn't raise your hand, so now I'm curious as to what you're using. I thought I got them all. I thought I covered them all. All right. Turning the slow query log on and off. Simple enough. Where's the slow query located? Right there. This is the one you want. Long query time. That determines whether or not a query is slow or not. If a query takes longer than that amount of time, it's not slow, and therefore it's not logged. Okay? So if you, have, if you set that long query time to 2, and a query takes 2.1 seconds, it won't get logged, and you will never know of its existence. Okay? Long query time equals zero does not mean off. It means zero, which means any query that takes longer than zero seconds, which is every query, that means every query will get logged into the slow query log, which is usually what you want. You want to know about every query, even the fast ones, because sometimes even the fast ones may still can be optimized in some way. Yeah. This could be fractions, too. You can do it at 0.1 if you want to do something like that. Slow verbosity is a feature of Percona Server. We have full, so we have a lot more extended statistics inside the slow query log itself. I'll look at an example of that. We also do slow uh, log uh, uh, sampling. So you can actually limit rate limit. So if you're scared of this, 
If you're scared of setting this to zero and you've got 30,000 queries per second in your system, you're going to go through a slow query log very rapidly. But instead, if you still want some good stuff, you can change that to do either session sampling or query sampling. So slow rate limit depends on what that one is. So if you said slow rate limit equals 10 and you had session, it basically logs all of the queries every 10th session. Yeah? Or if you had it set to query, and then you said slow rate limit equals 100, you're going to sample 1%. Basically, every 1% of queries that come through, you'll take a sample of those. Downsides to those methods is you may miss some queries. You know, if you're only looking at every 100th query, you might, bad luck, get the same query every time. Right? Log slow stored procedure statements feature at Percona Server. If you have stored procedures, typically in community, you can't see any of the select statements that are inside your stored procedure. But if you have this turned on, we add those to the slow query log as well. The last one is slow log filtering. So in Percona Server, you can say, I, I can put this to zero, log everything, but I want you to only log the ones that do full table scans, which that's pretty cool. Or only, this is actually orable. So you can pick and choose. So I only want to see the ones that are full table scan, comma, temp table on disk. So that'd be pretty neat. This is a, what PMM looks like. If you haven't seen PMM, come to our booth. We have PMM running in a, a, a chaos box that you can twist and tweak a whole bunch of values and stuff and see it changed instantly on the, on the graph. So have fun with that one. This is our query analysis. We grab all that data. We can aggregate it. You can click on one of these, and it shows you more stats down here. 30 days retention by default, so you can absolutely say what happened two weeks ago to that same query and watch as it changes in performance over time. Oh, hey, look, there's a timer. All right, what else can we do? Other than basic explain, we have explain format equals JSON. This gives you the same information that regular explain does, but it spits it out to you in a JSON string. There's some more stuff in JSON. It's usually all this cost info and all this extra stuff over here on the side. But all of this over here is everything that you already get in a standard explain output. Why do you want to use this? In theory, you could use something like this in your CI CD where you're actually checking queries as they get checked into your GitHub repo or your GitLab repo and vetting them automatically because your tooling could access a dummy system, run the explain output JSON, parse it all, and basically say if ref is not const or primary or whatever, you know, fail the, fail the merge request or something like that. So you could really get deep into integrating. Yeah. And then, yeah, then to just check against that, yeah. I would say fail to merge. If it's like a code push that I'm doing that, that has a new query, then I would say that would, I would say full table. Me personally, I'd say full table scan. If it, if, yeah, if I'm not, if I'm looking at, if, if it's, if ref is all, I would say fail to merge, yeah. Or I would say something maybe, does this have, ah, see, this is not going to have, um, rows examine versus, because you have to actually execute for rows examine. If you had a rows examine, if you get to analyze, I would say like a rows examine versus rows uh, affected um, ratio would be a bad ratio there. There was a question, yeah? Yep. In the JSON explain plan, there is, and that like this one, that's what it's telling you. But what this is, but this number, I can't read that number and say this is what it means because that number has 50 different algorithm metrics behind it. Okay. Yeah, because it it's a cost-based optimizer, but there's like a whole bunch of that. What? Go ahead. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a cost-based optimizer that's taking into account of, like, your, is, is a page already in the buffer pool? Is it on disk? You can actually tweak those. Like, you can actually tell MySQL, do I have SSDs or do I have spindle disks? And that will actually modify and merge those as well, which is weird. The, the cost numbers only really mean when you're doing, like, optimizer tracing. Because when you do an optimizer trace, you can actually see all of the choices that the optimizer is doing. And it's really just picking the cheapest one. So you could act, you'd have to turn on cost, uh, you'd have to turn on optimizer tracing in order to see like, why is it choosing this one? Why was this one the cheapest one? And tracing will give you so much more information about the decisions that the optimizer is making. 
Yep. Yep. And that score could change too. It, the same query, that score could change between now and five minutes from now. So that's why it's not as, it, th that query will not always cost this, this amount. Yep. How would you find a query that's low cost but highly repetitive, meaning it executes frequently in your system but it's still low cost? Ah, okay. Okay, so you have a bug in, so you got a bug in your code that's causing the same fast query to go more times than it should be going. I would say you would you would need PMM for that. You'd have to f you'd have to be logging every single one of those executions and then aggregate all that. And then you would throw an alarm in PMM that says if there's more than number of queries per second or per minute or whatever, you need to alarm us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yep. 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 So one of the other tools that I briefly mentioned was PT Query Digest, and so that one you would take your slow query log, run a report against that, and then run another report against your slow query log later, and you would see again the same stuff. That's obviously a manual process. If you had PMM. It's just always up to date. Yeah, cool. Yep. Top 10. Uh, the first page that you look at, <laughs> top 10. Actually, that says top 11, actually. I don't know why that one says 11, but that's top 11. This is in the last uh, 12 hours. So in the last 12 hours, these are the top 11 queries that ran across my entire environment. So it's so again, it's the, it's the load. So it's that's a combination of how long an individual query took and how many times it took. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can actually click where this says load right here. You can actually click that and change this column to filter on all the different stats that we collect for queries. By default, it's load, and it's by default sorted by load. But you can change that to query count, query time, change the window to the last hour, the last 20 hours. You can come over here and filter and say, I want this cluster and only look at those data. You can uh, have, I only want to look at my prod environment, or I only want to look at staging environment. Yeah, all over the place, yes. It supports custom tags as well. So when you add servers, you can put custom tags as well, and you would be able to filter on custom tags too. And what a AZs or availability zones, not specifically to Amazon, but you can put availability zones in there too. All right, explain format JSON. Explain format tree. Just kind of gives you a more, I don't know, I'm gonna visualization of the nested join actions that are taking place. Usually when you look at explain, they're all just kind of on that same level, and you kind of just, well, yeah, I understand they're going in that order. This is just giving you a little bit more visualization based, the spaces matter. That's not an artifact of my slides. That's actually how the spacing with the little arrows means. So this is basically saying we did a full table scan on title, and then we did filtering, and they were kind of you know merged together. Then we did a union up here between this result and that result, excuse me. We have the cost, we got rows. Again, those all estimates. 
So it's just a little bit a different way of looking at data. There's more data to it too, yeah. Mm, they probably should be. I'll put them somewhere. I don't know where, but I'll put them somewhere. <laughs> they didn't ask me or say I needed to submit them, so I, I will sure I will put them somewhere. Y you <laughs> probably on my Google Drive somewhere. They're on my. They're on. they I mean, I'm serving this live from my Google Drive, so if you want it, I can share them with you. I don't have a link or slide share or anything to put them. Yeah. Okay. The new one, which I recently started using and actually used it very well as cannon fodder against my client to show him how bad his queries were, it's awesome, is Explain Analyze. This came out in 8018, so it's fairly recent. Explain Analyze actually executes the query and gives you what the tree output does. But it gives you a little bit more in the sense of how many rows exactly and actual cost times. It's like prepared ma preparing time and then actual execution time. I don't know. I've never tried it against the right. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't try it against the right. I would imagine it's going to do something similar to on how standard explain does, where if it's like an update, it's going to rewrite it as a select uh, and do that still. Yeah, I haven't tried it uh, as a write. Mm -hmm. What version was that? If you did an explain on an update, it would actually execute it? Really? I did not know that. So at least five, because I've done that many a times on 5.7. I know that's not a, an issue on 5.7. Well, hopefully nobody here is running yeah, five six. Start over here on the left because I wasn't paying attention. The the first number is so it says are actually so this is like the what they say is like the like uh, oh, I'm trying to think of how to. I believe I I believe it's the uh, it's the time that it took to basically prepare and then it was the total execution time. I don't I know I'm not explaining that correctly and I'll have to I honestly will have to go back and look on that one. Um, because uh, yeah, because this because these two numbers don't those those two numbers don't make sense there. This makes sense here that it took that amount of time to prepare and that amount of time to execute. But I have to check on the other one for you. So uh, my apologies for that, for that for that understanding. Yes. Yeah. This this information usually is already inside the slow query log. Well, let me take that back. That's not correct. Um, so, like the slow query log is not going to contain the fact that you took a step to unionize two things together, and it took a step to do this, so on and so forth. The slow query log is not going to have that information in it. So, therefore, PMM would not have that information. No. But PMM will have the query in it. So, obviously, the query will still show up. And you would be able to click on the button that says, show me an example of that query. And then you could copy it and paste it and go in. You can run and explain live from inside PMM, but we don't have not expanded it to be explain analyze yet. I don't know. There will be a lot of overhead. I know in Percona Server you can turn on uh, query profiling for the slow query log, but that would be a lot of extra overhead. But that's still not the same thing as what we're seeing here. Yeah. So if I explain updates, it's No. Old version of MySQL. Not 5.7. Not a dot. That is a bug from an old version of MySQL. But even so, if you, I'm sorry. Yes, if you explain analyze. Yes, it will execute the update, yes. I would say that if you wanted to explain, analyze an update statement, that you yourself could just turn it into a, a select, because an update is essentially a, select, a read and then update, because we have to find the row first. So if you just took your update set, whatever, whatever, where something, you could just turn that into a select where something, and that's 
at least you've got stage one out of that update handled. And then past that is just the updating and the actual writing part. Yeah, do a select, yeah. Yep. Yep. Unless you're doing an explain analyze. So if we do an explain analyze on an update, that will execute because we know an analyze has to execute it. You could. Yeah. No, you'd have to write a tool for that. Yeah. No, PT Query Digest, you can connect PT Query Digest to a running MySQL server and it will run the explain for you, but it doesn't support explain analyze yet. Yeah. You could, because, the, because PT Query Digest is written in Perl, you could edit the Perl and just where, find where it executes the explain and just put format equals analyze in front of it and you'll, you'll get that out. Just change the code. <laughs> oh, it's not going to know those, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little hacky. You could, but it's a little hacky. All right. Going beyond explain. So explain doesn't really give you, explain itself doesn't give you post, ana post execution analysis unless you're doing explain analyze. What are some other things that we can do to find out really what did that query do? Okay, the first one that I want to explain is our handler stats. So contrary to popular belief, NoDB is still technically a plugin to MySQL. It's just now a required plugin into MySQL. It still behaves as a pluggable engine. Whenever you write a query and it's sent to the optimizer, the optimizer is turning your SQL into a series of API calls. Those API calls are what go down to an engine, whether you're using NODB, MyRox, or whatever. Engines just implement API function calls. So when you say something like, I want to select from this table, the optimizer says, oh, there's an index. I'm going to call this function on the engine and say, hey, Mr. Engine, find this data using this index. The optimizer decides the index to use. The engine does not make that decision. Okay? So you can count, well, MySQL is already doing this for you, but you can actually see the counters every time the optimizer has to call one of those particular API calls down to the engine to fetch data. These are both session and global, so you can do flush status and reset the counters for your session, execute some query, look at the counters, and you can say something like, handler read random next is all numbers and everything else is zero. That means that we did a full table scan, because this is random data. We don't like random data. Yeah. Very nicely, these are also automatically grabbed by PMM. It's usually the first graph I go to when I'm doing analysis on a client's machine is I go look at these globally and right off the bat I can say on average you have more queries that don't use indexes than do use indexes. You have a query problem not a hardware problem in most cases. Yeah, usually. If that read random next is the highest graph line on that, we got a query problem. Let's fix your queries. Fixing queries is so much cheaper than adding CPU or adding RAM. You can also do profiling. If an Oracle engineer wants to tell me why you're deprecating this, you know, I'll fight you. This is so easy. But if you do set profiling, even on eight, it says deprecated. Like, no. So easy. The performance schema way is so kludgy and cumbersome. This is easy. Turn it on, run your query, look at the profile. <laughs> Done. Profiling is all the different stages that your query took during its execution. Checking permissions, opening the table, optimizing it. Ooh, lovely. Creating temporary table. Sorting, sorting. Ooh. Converting heap to my ISAM. This is old. Anybody know what that means? The gentleman laughing, what's it mean? Well, no, what's it really mean? <laughs> so it's 5.7, yeah, so this is a 5.7 server. So anybody know what converting heap to my ISAM might mean? 
I'm going to take S. So think, think of this one, and now think of that one. Go ahead. So this is a temporary table in memory, and then this is a temporary table on disk. So that's what that is. Now, tenth of a second, eh. Now, on a system that I jumped on and did this on, that took the majority of this time. So if you see create a converting heap to my ISAM and it takes 76 seconds, okay, either A, the table is giant and has to be spilled over to temporary on disk, or, in my case, the sand that they were mounted on was not configured correctly. And I got to use this as cannon fodder to their sand engineer who swore to me that I had the best performing disks mounted on the database server. He had it misconfigured. I, I saw this, and then I took sysbench, and I did some basic file O test, and I said, dude, this sand can't write faster than 50 megabytes a second. You can't tell me that I have the best out of this EMC multi-million dollar sand. And he was like, rrr, 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 and then like an hour later, I get a message, and he's like, yeah, okay, so I didn't have this thing configured correctly, try it again, and boop, magic. Look at that. Not everything, your, every query will not go through every, there are certainly some stages missing on here. Okay, so if your query doesn't do a temporary table on disk, you're not going to see that stage. The other one that I got once was uh, in the checking permissions. I got a checking permissions that took 10 seconds. I was like, why does it take 10, 10 seconds to check permissions? That should be really fast. Turns out that that client was using uh, host name based user accounts. And every time that you logged into MySQL, it has to do a reverse DNS check. Their DNS, internal DNS, was having issues slow queries. Who would have thunk it? But profiling worked out great. Yeah. They are, but I was still just like, why is this query running slow? And it's just like, because, yeah, just, yeah. Mm-mm. -hmm. You could, no, if you are just a regular app user, you can profile your own queries. I'm pretty sure you can profile your own queries. There's nothing sensitive in it that should prevent you from doing that. None. It's just a, for your, it's for your session only. It's a per session. So I would turn it on for my session, and then any queries that I ran would be profiled, and the profile would be recorded or saved in memory. So as long as you don't turn on profile and then, can, then go run a gajillion queries, you're, you're going to be fine. No, I don't think you can. I don't think you can turn profiling on globally. I wouldn't want to either. I think at Percona server, actually, you can. In Percona server, you can turn on profiling globally, and it'll be in the slow query log. I would not do that, though. That would, that would be some big overhead. Maybe your dev environment where nobody cares, but not production. Done. 54 minutes. Sweet. Um, if you have questions, obviously still have questions. I am extremely active in our forums, and our forums are extremely active themselves. It's free community support by people like me and Pep and the other people at Percona. So if you've got questions about MySQL, Maria, Mongo, Postgres, you want to know what the next hot movie is? No, I don't think we actually, we actually do have an uncategorized category, so you know, but whatever.